One's rolling. Rolling. Oh, thank you. Rolling. Rolling. All right, can we have a clap? Oh, we've been so nervous. Y'all weird. We don't know what to do. It's like, are we clapping? Do we clap? I mean, I if, you, if you feel led, you can clap as well. Okay. Y'all just, just tap it up. Hey. You want to spit that? Uh. Hey. Don't take the time out. Okay. 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 because this league, Athletes Unlimited, has only existed online. So I want to know, as y'all, you know, Izzy and Lexi, y'all are the ones who last released that y'all were in it. What have y'all been hearing online about the league in general? I've heard a lot of positive things, but I've also had seen like a lot of questions and uncertainty about it, which that makes me excited because, you know, I feel like we're pioneers of this. Like, nobody thought that we would be able to gather this many players and come play in a league that's competitive, that's fun, that's going to be enjoyable, and it's going to be exciting. So I'm really um, looking forward to showing people what this league is going to be about and, you know, how, how much fun we're going to have. Oh, well, I mean, I would just throw in that uh, Lexi first. was actually, yeah, no, I signed first, yeah. but Lexi was actually also on board early and uh, she Life dropped was, out. Yeah. Oh, okay. Life yeah. happened. So, um, Lexi, she, 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 left, she was on the PEC. <laughs> I hate to turn the conversation, but she left us, yeah. yeah. But and she's then, here now. And then as she, you yeah, know, she but we're not so quick to forgive. <laughs> I told them that there was a good chance that I would be back. Yeah. Wait, I told can you, you right? get into it? Because I had like, no idea. Why, why, exactly. Why? Yeah, I Let's dive in. Guys, y'all know the, what happened to me over the summer. I okay. was on a team, then yeah. I wasn't on a team, True. and I had to prepare for my future, which was having to go overseas. Mm -hmm. So I did end up going overseas. I went to France, and I just realized that it wasn't it wasn't giving what I thought it was going to give. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't giving. giving. Um, you know, being overseas for seven months, you play once a week. Um, you know, they released the schedule for eight for AU and you're playing three times a week in mm -hmm. six weeks, so I'm like, I'm gonna be playing the same amount of games in a shorter time. I get to be home, I get to do things off the court that I care about, be with people that I that I know and you know, things like that. So Yeah. Welcome back. Thanks welcome guys. Back. Yeah. They welcomed me back with open arms, which I was very grateful for that because they did say like we'll have a spot for you, but I wasn't really sure if there was gonna be one. And then there wasn't <laughs> <laughs> So we're good. We're all back. We're here. Yeah, we're good right now. Okay. Now, Sid. Now back yeah. to you. No, no, no. But for well, real, we're glad to have you. But no, for real, it was it was difficult because this sounds like a pipe dream to a lot of people yeah. because. Once again, the WNBA is what's existed. So people have heard about other things like coming, like happening right. in, in previous years, like maybe even decades ago, but Trying it never happened. Women yeah. So when you hear yeah. something like this and you hear you're going to be paid, it's going to be in one location, there's going to be great competition, people are like, oh, yeah. And it's okay. going to be streamed for people to watch. And it's going to be streamed. Right. Every, like every game at least will be streamed for people to watch. And, right. your, and your, your people will be able to come see you. Like friends and family can see you play in person, and for a lot of people, that's not their reality because they've only been overseas or been in the WNBA, but like only in training camp and never been on a team. So it was just, it was difficult at first until the announcement was made. And then once the announcement was made, it was like right. so people many people reaching out to be a part How of can it. I join? Which How is kind of what, yeah. what we expected, right. I think. Yeah. We knew like once we announced it, so many people would want to be on board with it. And the feedback was phenomenal for sure. Yeah. So we heard a lot of buzz about AU on social media. I want to know, I mean, everybody at this table utilizes social media in different ways. So let's start with Sid because she's just looking ready. <laughs> What's your relationship with social media? Um, it's been a tough one. Oh, girl. <laughs> um, but I feel like through the ups and downs, we've found our way back. Um, like at times a little 
toxic. I think that's like the buzzword right now. <laughs> no, legitimately. I mean, like I use it for like fun. You know, like sometimes it'll be like a video that I intend for it to be funny or be a parody, but it might actually be about something that's serious and going on, but I'm just doing it like in a more light hearted yeah. way. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I like social media for that. Like being able to provide laughter, like that's fun to me. Being able to provide like relief for people, like I, I enjoy that. I'm sure the general public is thrilled that you utilize it. And then um, Tamara, you have millions of followers. Um, we're all just trying to get like you. So. Yep. What's your relationship with it? I, I love social media. I love pictures. Um, I use it for business. I use it for funny videos. I use it to entertain my people. I use it to make money. I do. Some people feel that they know you or they could just say anything on social media. So that aspect, I hate. But for me, I'm a positive person. And if I see anything remotely negative, like, it could be the simplest thing. I'll just block you and delete your comment. Like, and that's all period. Yeah, that's it. And just keep moving. It gives people such a false sense of truly understanding, like, what you got going on. Mm -hmm. And I think as I've gotten older, I've become a little bit more private about things that I've been doing and what I have going on. And I don't know why all of a sudden I decided to do that, but I don't be hanging out all the time. Mm -hmm. But Twitter actually is my favorite mm -hmm. uh, platform. Out of everything? Out of everything. <laughs> <laughs> I love Twitter because I love, Twitter. I love yeah. going back and forth with people on Twitter. You sure do. You come I love it for you. <laughs> I've stopped doing it a little bit more because I just don't, I don't like going back and forth with people that I like aren't real. Mm -hmm. So like if you're not like a real person, oh, no. like the, fake <laughs> the fake pages, I can't, I used to all the time. Like that was what I was known for. Everyone oh, was like, Lexi gonna get, Lexi gonna get you. But now I'm like, if you don't have a picture or you have like a, another athlete or something, I'm like, yeah, I'm not talking to you. But it is a good way to connect with people show a little bit what you're doing, show a little bit part of your life, but um, you know, you, everyone uses it differently and that's the, the beautiful thing about it. I, I just think it's, it's great that you know you can set your boundary, right? Yeah. But I also think it's okay if you hang out with your girls because you're literally everyone in your thinks 20s, I hang you're out like living your best life and you literally have a championship, so what can yeah, anybody yeah. say? Facts. Period. I do. Period. <laughs> giving she the oh, champion. That's what it says, I never even saw. Yeah. That's dope. Thank you. That's really cool. Thank you. You know, what I love what you said was you get a bag from your social media. And I see um, brand deals coming everybody's way. So <laughs> not, mine. Is, not mine. Not <laughs> mine. Let's talk about it. <laughs> Let's like, actually let's talk about it. Talk about it. it. Brand? 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 Which camera is it? <laughs> Which camera? Brand. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a second. Give me a second. Give me a second. Give me a second. Go, go, go. Um, <laughs> Well, my, my take on social media, I feel like it actually gives people a chance to, like, to get to know you. Uh -huh. Like, they see you on the court and do one thing, but when you actually can go on someone's social media and see, like, what they're interested in, mm -hmm. what they like to do, like, you get to know the person. Mm -hmm. And I love that because sometimes I don't always, I feel like women athletes don't always have the biggest platform to show who they are. Mm -hmm. So, you know, after you see a game, you want to get to know more about whoever the person is. You go to their social media and it's like, oh, they're interested in yada, yada, yada. And I think that's, like, the best part that you can do. But I've gotten a lot of brands, especially this past year, like brands reaching out to me, like Do you see the skin? It's yeah, the skin. yes. skincare, you know, yeah. all that. Um, skincare, modeling, just things I've been loving and wanting to do. And it's, you know, it's slowly coming, but I'm appreciative for literally everything that's been coming, coming yeah. my way. I mean, yeah. you're so humble about it. I learned, yeah. like, skincare from you. That's crazy. That is crazy. Oh, thank you. Yes, you are more than welcome. Okay, so how have you guys been able to set boundaries for yourself within, like, social media? I think my biggest thing is... Before I used to like answer DMs to like fans or whatever. So if they would ask me a question, I would be like, it's nothing to answer back to you. But then like Ty was saying, it makes them feel like they really know who you are and then they just feel like you owe that to them. So I, I stopped doing that. I actually go through a service now. So you have to actually like pay to DM me. And I mean, a lot of athletes do it. And I think it's, an, it's a, a really good thing because I think it's putting women athletes on a bigger platform for us. Like, you know, you have to respect us. Like, you just can't go up and talk to any athlete like that. You got to, you know, pay to do certain things like that. So I do that. Um, if I'm going somewhere, I don't post it immediately when I'm there. I post it when I'm leaving. 
And those are the two main things that I do. I think it's good to be responsive because like when I've had people that I like or like I admire work that they do or something that they do and they respond back, it's kind of like the fan of someone dynamic to feel like, okay, cool. They saw what I said. They see that I like what they do. So like when it's complimentary stuff, I don't have a problem. Like when people say something crazy though, like I usually pin it so people can just like talk about them for me. I don't even yes. do it. I just pin it <laughs> and I let, I, let, I, let I let the people in my comments handle it. Yeah. I'm like, y'all, I don't even have to say nothing. I pinned it, so that means <laughs> you know, get them. Okay. It's like, yeah, yeah. Like and so, I don't know. And then same as what Izzy is saying, like people DMing, all answer to it like a certain extent, but then people definitely will start to like abuse it. And I'm not trying to say like we're untouchable, like you can't speak to us. It's just but there like, are limits. I mean, but it's, it's okay there should to say be limits. limits. You know, these, these aren't your best friends. Right, you know? right. So like, cool. Like, comment every now and then, mm. quick reaction. But like, I, I don't actually know you. Like, I'm not just gonna keep mm. holding this conversation. Especially like guys will just if you respond to one thing, dang. So what's up? Like, where you, where you live? Like, where you? There are plenty of skits for y'all. Out yeah. there. Yes. Yeah. yes. I told y'all that. Yes. Cut it out. So <laughs> that's how I handle that. <laughs> But, Ty, you have a unique situation where your life is not only on social media, but it's on television, too. And so how do you set the boundaries? Because I know whenever you go, I mean, you're very popular. (laughs) We're we're just going to say you're very popular. So how are you able to, in real life, set these boundaries? Because I know it's chaos wherever you go. Honestly, like, you have to have tough skin um, with being, like you said, the reality TV, showing a relationship. Because even with that, it's TV. It has to be entertainment. And people get a false, you know, thing from that as well. They feel like they know you. They feel like they know your relationship. But at the end of the day, it's entertainment. You don't really know me or my relationship. So it's the same with certain comments. People always have something to say. If it's negative, I delete it and I block it. Um, The same as when I go certain places, I won't post where I'm at until I've already left. Um, I respond to to people who have positive things to say. uh, But... You definitely have to have tough skin because people through the internet, they feel like they can say anything and it's okay. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, like, yeah, I have a, a status, a celebrity status, but I'm still human, you know? Like, you can't just talk to me any type of way and think because you're a fan that it's okay. Before, I used to respond to people, mm-hmm. but as I grew and realized, a lot of people, they just want attention. Mm-hmm. They want a response. So they say certain things to try to trigger you and get a response. So now I just learn to just block it, block the person and delete the comment. Y'all play basketball for a living. And people, a lot of people have a lot to say. How do you know when to pay mind to the critics on, you know, who post about your game or who talk about basketball that don't really know basketball or who do know basketball? How do you filter that out and make sure that, like, you're protecting your mental health with that? It's your career. If I do see something a little bit negative, sometimes I'll go to their page and see them. All they do is talk... Their whole page is negative. They're talking about everybody. So I'm like, this is like their journal. Like, they're miserable. So, like, you can't always take everything to heart because, you know, they might be going through something weird. Like, Mm -hmm. you don't know who this person is. And that's why I think I stopped, like, going after people, too, because I'm like, what is the point? And then there were so many situations where I'd go after somebody, and then, like, 10 minutes later, I would get, like, a DM from them. And they'd be like... Oh, I didn't mean it. I feel like it's like human nature to like, you low key want to like protect yourself. Like, because everybody puts their best foot forward on social media. Mm -hmm. So you kind of are expecting positive feedback. I don't think anybody puts stuff up expecting negativity. So if some, if everything is overwhelmingly positive, and and there's a person who's (laughs) negative for no reason, it's like, what's your deal? Like, you're the only only one, (laughs) you're the only one with this like viewpoint. Like, so. Like I said, that's when I just, like, pin people. Because I think it's funny. Like, I don't take stuff to heart. So I'm just like, okay, that's how you feel. You're, you're entitled. Like, yeah. I mostly post videos that I think are funny. But, like, I never care if people think I'm funny or not. I'm going to get my jokes off. Yeah. For me. Yeah. I do these jokes yeah. for yeah. me. Yeah. I'm like, this is for me. Yeah. Even if nobody laughed, I would keep them going. So, like, <laughs> when somebody is like, you're not even funny to me, I'm just like, that's fine, but I'm going to pin it. And then, like... You're on my yeah. right. And the you crazy thing that. is, they will never say this to your face. In real life, I've never said, heard anything yeah. negative about my basketball. Yeah, I love what I they do want to attention. They do want attention. There, you there was a guy. Like, there was a guy. Like, let's talk about it. A dude tweeted me and like. My w, like my WNBA career didn't go the way that I wanted to go, but I'm grateful that I had like a six year career. I'm like I have no problems. Like basketball is a part of my life, but by no means does anything that I do on the court like 
Mitchell make me. <laughs> but like it doesn't make yeah. me feel less or more about yeah, myself. I'm like it's it's a it's a sport. You get yeah. paid it's our job yeah. and it's fun. Like yeah. you're taking it way too serious. So I had, I had done said something, and he was like, "You need to shut up." Like over your six year career, you averaged like four points, and I was like, "You gave me two points too many." I think I think it was <laughs> <laughs> I think it was two, but that's, <laughs> so that pisses them off more. I think when you don't get mad, yeah. but when you don't you get mad about them being rude. Then they just, he didn't respond again. Because what do you yeah. say to somebody who makes fun of themselves? Yeah. If I have a bad game, you don't think I'm at my house like, dang, I had a bad game. Right. Why do you think I well, need be like, you to be like... They'll be like, you ride the bench. Why are you talking? It's like, I don't know. I'm still in the league, though, and I get paid the same amount. Yeah. So, I don't know. I don't oh, care, dude. Totally. <laughs> yeah, so... Mm. Y'all are the best of the best. And then playing in such competitive leagues, you know, you have the WNBA, you have AU, and and you're having to mold yourself a little bit. What was that like to bite the bullet? In? <laughs> that makes it sound so negative. How were you able to adjust to yeah. what your coaches wanted over the years? So OK, fun. let's start with Tasha. Yeah, she's ready, she's ready. Yeah. Whenever she's ready, I'm like, let's go. As soon as you started talking about roles, she's like, you yeah. <laughs> She said, she said, because I know. my role changed drastically so coming yeah. out of college a score, you know? Um, being in Atlanta, I had that same mentality. Then when I was traded to Chicago, my coach specifically said to me, your job here, if you want to play on my team, is to play defense and rebound. And I'm like, I want to score. Like, I'm a scorer. And he literally, I remember it was one game. I had 10 points in one quarter, and he literally set me the rest of the game. It was like, I told you, I have my scorers. Defend and rebound if you want to play. And I love basketball, so I wanted to play. And so that's what I had to learn to do if I wanted to stay on the team and play. And... I mean, I lasted 12 years in the in the league by having that role. It wasn't something that I wanted, but it was something I was willing to do for the betterment of the team and to still be on the court. I feel like I've had every single role possible on the team. You know, I was a bench warmer, then I was a first first second player off the bench, shooter. Then I was a starter, and then I got hurt, I had a concussion. And then I went back to being a bench former again. So it's kind of been like this full circle moment. But like you said, I, I left with a championship, which I'm so grateful for. I mean, this summer was one of the best of my life. Um, so I'm just really excited to see what, what the future holds. And I think Athletes Unlimited is going to be super helpful with that. I can't wait to see how you show up for this season. I, I love, you know, I'm your biggest cheerleader. And Sid, you've always been a leader whether it's bringing the energy or just literally gathering the girls. Mm -hmm. so, what, so what opportunity or what role do you see yourself playing within this? Because you're already like up there, up there. You, you, you brought them in. So what, <laughs> so what role do you see yourself in? Mm, I think I'm, I'm always just myself wherever I go. Mm -hmm. And so like the adjustment is never really crazy. Like I'm always going to, whether things are going well for me or not, I'm going to be a great teammate. I'm gonna encourage people. Like, I'm very fun on the court. Like, I like to play. Like, when me and Ty played together in Vegas, it was like our camaraderie and our second group was crazy because we wanted the team to win and we wanted to see, like, we didn't care about seeing like individual people do well. So it was very easy to mesh with people like that. And I feel like Athletes Unlimited provides an opportunity for you to create teams like that. Like, you know, people are, you play with some of them, you played against them. You kind of know what makes them tick or you've experienced things. So you're like, okay, I can create this team with people who are like-minded and we can go get this. And for me, like, my experiences on teams have been, like, energy, defense, you know, transition. Like, that's been my role. And I've never... Like, I don't feel like I was... I'm I kind of feel like Lexi. Like, I don't think that I was ever giving given like the grace to make enough mistakes to really be able to play throughout a long enough time. But I was always just like, you know what, I'm gonna make the most of the time that I'm out there though. Cause this, like how it can go for people is that you're in situations with coaches for several years in a row and nobody sees you for who you are. And you have a view of yourself that nobody has understood yet. And you could get to your seventh year in the league and there's finally that coach that lets you be you and who lets you do what you know you've been capable of doing, but it's a matter of, for those six years, did your confidence drop? Yeah. Did you stop working? Did you become a bad teammate? Did you become cancerous because things weren't going your way? And then that seventh year when somebody maybe would have been ready to give you a chance, were you too jaded from all of that stuff before to be ready for that moment? And I think a lot of people don't make it to that moment because you let these people change you. Yeah. And what I try to tell a lot of players is that 
you're going to get into the real world and you might be in a situation in a job where, one, they don't care that you were a professional athlete anymore. And you're going to like, maybe you see something for yourself in that job and you're like, oh, I think I can do this. Like, I think I can do more. Uh, you want to ask for more in a role. I think I can get a raise. But they didn't ask you for that. Yeah. And you don't get that. Yeah. And you might not be a favorite at your job, but then you might get a new boss one day. And now all of a sudden you do get that raise. You do get that promotion. You get to do what you know you've been capable of doing, but did you give up on yourself during that time before? And I think a lot of people miss the moment that could be coming because they get caught up in the negative or the now. You really can't control nothing in this business, mm -hmm. but you gotta remain who you are in that situation. So when I got traded to Dallas, I could have been negative about it. I was like, yeah. well, like, why am I here right now? People talk about Dallas all the time, but mm -hmm. you can see like we've made progress and yeah. I've established my role on that team. But mm -hmm. had I had a negative, you know, mindset about it, like I don't, I could have been anywhere. I mean, the past year alone, yeah. so much growth. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about that too? Of you yeah. as a player on and off the court? I would say on the court, I had the most growth this year, but honestly, I just had to be more selfish with what I wanted for my career. Because again, I hear stories about just veteran players. I'm mid-career right now. So it's like, I've had my experience in the past and I still have more of my future to look forward to. So I'm kind of just deciding what do I want for myself? What do I want Isabel to be established from? I came from Tennessee, like, you know, a really good program. And at the end of the day, I still think about what Pat would want for me and how the type of player I am. Um, and this year, I really just got to set in my role and just take charge of the team. I'm a vet on that team. So being able to just, you know, put my foot down and like, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to move forward. And it, it made a difference. We got to our first playoff and like, whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, Lexi, they took us out, but <laughs> Look, <laughs> they took them out. I'm glad, I'm glad that y'all won it, but it was growth for us, right? And I can't compare my story to anybody else's. You were meant to be in that situation, no matter what you went through. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's different for everybody. And I'm glad I had that. Um, experience for, you know, my own. Snow, Secret, Pat Summit's legacy. Can you walk us through, especially like as a player, growing in, and learning whatever she taught you, can you give us some values that she instilled in you? And honestly, just talk candidly about the program that we don't know. My freshman year, I was playing behind like five All-Americans and four out of the five were in my position. Mm -hmm. So obviously, you know, you go into college, you kind of have like, well, this is what I need to do. Like that freshman, like arrogance, that I don't know why we do that. Um, and I was experiencing that. It's crazy to me, what, like looking back, but I was doing that and she definitely saw my confidence go like so, so, so low. And at the same time, this is when she first announced like she was having her early onset dementia. And she sat me down during like a practice and she was like, Izzy, it's literally never okay to have a pity party. And she said that and it kind of shocked me back to reality. like. I'm worried about basketball and playing time and she's literally like losing her memory and she can't remember her closest friends around her. And I just remember kind of like looking at her eyes. Of course I was scared, but I was like, man, like I, I really I really feel what you're going through. Um, and obviously I carried that with me throughout Tennessee. Like if, I, if something wasn't going my way, I was never going to like complain about it or just bring other people down. I was just gonna be Izzy. And it definitely made an impact throughout my years in Tennessee. Um, so then being drafted to the league, I played in Phoenix. I had Dinas Rozzi, Penny Taylor, Candice Dupree. I was never going to play, but my mom, <laughs> it was no, never no, going to happen. Never, that was never, know? yeah, no. that was never in the plans. No. And I, I just was so happy I had that experience with Pat because mm -hmm. I could have came in and really like burnt myself. Like I might not have been on a team, like they didn't care like what I did at Tennessee. Um, and if anything, I was like an energy player. I was able to like coach every, not coach, but lift up everybody else while I was playing there. Um, but honestly, having that experience with Pat, like not not too many people have that. Um, amazing, amazing coach, but as a woman, what she wanted for women's. And I was thinking about this earlier today, starting this league, I think this is something she would be so proud about because she is such a pioneer and a leader for women's basketball. And had she be here right now, like today, I think she would be really proud about everything that we're doing right now. Yeah, let's dive more into the league because this is player run. And so y'all have to trust each other with the direction that y'all are going in the week. How do you think that that's gonna play into effect? Like, how do you think that that's gonna help you guys succeed or maybe not? I honestly have no idea how this is gonna turn out. And I think that's the exciting part. Um, like Sid and Ty said, when they were choosing the players to bring in, like 
it wasn't a ran like no, nobody was chosen at random. Like we brought in a lot of good people. They I mean they're good players, but they're better people. And we I, I remember when I was in the PC earlier, like that was something that we really wanted to talk about was having good players, but they had to be great people for the most part. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> <laughs> okay, so but when you did when you did have coaches, or you still do, I guess you know, but not this. But when you did have coaches, you've gone through several. So, so I want to jump into yours because mid major. Look at you now. Look at you. Look, Look at, at your big you money. <laughs> <laughs> um, me choosing James Madison, uh, Coach Brooks. Uh, I just felt the connection, and I wanted to go to a school where I could make a difference. Um, there were larger, uh, bigger schools that were recruiting me, but I didn't want to go to a school where I would have to sit and wait after a player that was older than me. I wanted to make an immediate impact. And I knew that if I was good enough and I put the work in, in which I did, that they would find me. Mm -hmm. And my coaches, all of them from high school to AAU to college helped me with that, um, with that work ethic. Like, like she said, I was a gym rat at a young age. I just loved to play ball but I was also able to listen to my coaches uh, when they would critique me or when they tried to make me be better. I knew that they knew what my ultimate goal was and they were just preparing me. I mean, it could be if you're from North Carolina, so you already know how we do. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just North saying, Carolina. Just let me know, just the product of North Carolina. We just work hard. Sydney, you had a national championship in, in college and mm -hmm. I want to know what the coaches played a part in that. Obviously, they play a huge part of the coaching. Yeah. But is that where you had the best coach-player relationship? I think my a &M coaches were the most impactful. Um, like, I, I was grateful to go to a school where I had two African-American assistant, female assistants. Like, for me, that was big because I knew down the line that, like, I wanted to coach. So it's helpful to be somewhere where, even though the head coach wasn't black, I still had two women that I could watch every day, that I was learning from every day, who were pouring into me and our team every day, um, and who would sometimes understand things that we were going through that the other two coaches weren't gonna understand. And so, like, that was vitally important for me. Um, they would, like, purposely, and I mean, I'm sure everybody experienced this with their teams, but the coach will, you know, pick certain people certain days that they're just on their ass. Even, even though they're not really even messing up, they might not even be doing anything wrong, but it's, something that that individual player needs for their mental and physical toughness. And then it's a time for the rest of the players to like huddle around them. But also if they're starting to get down on themselves, like you got to bring them along. And so they would just create situations to, we got to a point to where like they didn't have to be involved in off the court stuff or locker room stuff because we handled it inside. And I think the pride that we had in like carrying ourselves a certain way on and off the court trickled into how like we gelled and like our chemistry because even though people may have not liked you sometimes telling them about things that they're doing that are affecting the team, they respected it later and they realized later that, okay, you know what, you were right. Leadership is defined differently now for this generation. You always have to constantly shift how you coach kids and how you mm -hmm. lead kids or it's even each other. Yeah. Yeah. So like, can we speak to how coaching has had to be like forced yeah. to evolve? Because that's the, that's something yeah. we don't talk about, right? Like you cannot coach these kids the same, the same way they way. they coach, no. you know, no. class of twenty. Because they will leave. You know, like no. Yeah. No. Yeah. even what you was talking about. Yeah, like how y'all had to huddle up and get on each other, and the coaches would pick players that they would just be on heavy. They can't do that now. Mm. The transfer portal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bye -bye. Out of there. No, seriously. Seriously, and not only like I'm not. Mental health is important. Toxic environments do exist in college basketball. People For do sure. need to get out. But sometimes there are just things that happen in basketball and people can use one word mm -hmm. and it's over for like a staff or a situation. Like we've probably all been in situations like that where like we've seen what's going on and we're like, that's not what you said that was. That's so, so I said like mental health versus the mental strength to compete. Exactly. I wonder... Those situations definitely prepared us and yeah. helped us to be mentally tougher players. Yes. Uh -huh. Like, sometimes, absolutely. sometimes it had nothing to do with basketball. Yeah. yeah. Like, we had conditioning testing. Why are we running a mile and a half on the track? Right. Like, yeah. Why are we doing that? Make you mentally tougher. Yeah. yeah. That's all it was. It was a mental test.
Not to discount anybody's. No, 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 no. Right? I, I, I just look like, where we all are at. Yeah, yeah. like I think this generation is just different. I, I, like I'm not gonna say people are because I don't think everybody's softer, but I think there's definitely been a shift in like what's allowed and what's tolerated, like in the world in general. Mm -hmm. And so it's like trickled down to sports, like some things won't be tolerated, at least for a certain amount of time. And I think the kids have sensed that. So if it gets to a point where practices are a little too hard, I'm telling, or I'm using, I'm using a certain word and I'm not discounting people who really go through things because people really have legitimate issues in colleges. But there are also people who are, you know, kids in this generation who are smart enough to realize, okay, this is what I can get away with. Yeah. I can finesse this, say this look like that. I'm out, or that's just I'm gonna get coach Period. Out. Yeah. People know what they can get over with, what yeah. they can get away with, and yeah. what they can what they can use to their advantage. Yeah. Kids, adults, we all know, Everybody. and people still do it. Yeah. You know, so because how can you say I'm not struggling? Like, oh, this is too much mental health. You can't really see it on paper, yeah. right? So mm -hmm. I think that's something sometimes people use as a crutch when it's like, no, people are actually going through things, yeah. and now it's like you don't know who's really going through anything yeah. anymore. What What is some advice? how to deal with a competitive atmosphere in, in a world where we're like, oh, nope, this is not, mm -mm, this ain't right. Uh, I would say you remain a good person to people mm -hmm. because in my experience, whether I like what was going on with me or not, something came along down the line that I was prepared for because I just did not let people change who I was or like my belief in myself. So if you stick to who you are, if who you are is a decent person, <laughs> then you will be okay. Treat other people well, whether things are going for you, well for you or not. My first year or two in the league, I definitely had a negative aura about me because I was not enjoying what was going on. And I had my, both of my parents snap me out of it quickly. And they're like, your career is going to be way shorter than you want it to be if you, keep, <laughs> if you keep carrying yourself like this because this is not the person that we raised. And, I mean, I heard them and I was like, okay, but I think I internally, finally, something clicked in me. I think, I think it was after I got my concussion, really, where I was <laughs> like, it literally knocked some sense into me and was like, all right, now you're sitting. Yeah. Now you really have time to think. Um, and now you are forced to be a great teammate and just a supporter. Um, but yeah, just having the right people around you in your circle is so important. I see so many people go down a wrong path because they have people around them that are just allowing them to carry themselves whatever type of way. It just happens that way sometimes, so it's important to have um, good people around you. I want to reel it back into youth, your youth, and the coaches of your youth. What was your experience when you were growing up, you know, playing AAU and on the younger side of things with their coaches? So I'm one of 12. Yeah, I'm number 10 out of the whole bunch. Same mom, same dad. People always ask me that, and I never understood. <laughs> but people so always so ask me that. So <laughs> they do. I never no, knew that. Ask me that. They always ask me that, That's but so I didn't weird. understand like the family dynamic. That's not normal for people to say mom, yeah, same dad. Yeah, I'm the only grandchild. I got a present. See, yeah, that wasn't, that was different for me. Not unless you say it. <laughs> <laughs> she was really doing all right. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, but so growing up just around this tendency, we were always just like one of the best. People wanted like a Harrison on their team. Um, but I think, okay, Harrison. Very much so. Um, shout out to y'all. Um, but going into AAU, you started to play people from other states. So it's like, oh, snap, I'm really not the best at what I do. And it, it humbled me for one, but it also allowed my coaches to push me to be even better. Like you're going to see more competition at this age and other girls that want it just as much as you. And you can't ride on a Harrison anymore. Like this is what you're doing and you have to establish yourself. And I played for a Tennessee flight. And this is before like they ended that rule, like you can only recruit around surrounding states. So we was recruiting from like Cali, like literally everywhere. And we were like one of the best. We had a whole squad. AU is different now, like everyone wants to be like uh, the person on their team. When we were growing up, like we was like making sure every, the best players in the state were on the same AAU team. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to whip up on everybody else around the country. But now I feel like it's, you have like one really good player on an AU team and there's like 500 AU teams with one good player on there instead of all the girls coming together to be like a super team, which that's what made AU fun.
Wait, just like slaughtering that. everybody? Yeah, yeah, but like there was also other really, really good teams. So do you think y'all influence like the NBA with people choosing what <laughs> teams? Oh, <they're> like... <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Super teams? Y'all started the super teams. We started the super teams <laughs> as 13 year olds cool. in Atlanta, Georgia. Shout out to y'all. Shout out to the Georgia Ice. Shout out to us. Shout out to the Ice. <laughs> what about you, Ty? Um, I feel like my AAU time, my coach taught me how to be versatile. Um, I didn't play AAU until like the 10th grade. And when I joined the team, they all have been playing together since like seven or eight. And when I joined, I was like one of the tallest players, but I was a guard. And so when he put me in the post, I'm like, I'm not a post player. I'm not playing the post. And he, you know, pulled me to the side. was like, this will make you more versatile. Like, just trust me. And so I had to trust him, and it did. It, it helped me for college and for the league being a more versatile player because I was stuck in just being in my one position at the guard position, and that was it. And so when I listened to him and trusted him, it, it was better for my career to be a more versatile type player. You know, we, we talked about the new generation and what we would tell them, but what would you guys tell the new, co or the new coaches? Like, what is something you wish that they would have told you when you were younger? I think you have to establish a culture in your program. If you just let anybody, we all come from different backgrounds and upbringings, so if, no matter if they're good or not, if you just let anybody in that program and do whatever, like you're not gonna be able to control what you wanna do. If you have a culture and you have your rules, again, very much what Pat did, what you go by, we're not folding or bending on any of these rules. I think it just helps to establish like um, just a foundation. Mm -hmm. A good foundation is absolutely necessary. Yeah. I had a teammate who was like really into fashion and our coach like let her like miss things sometimes because she was doing internships and she was designing her own clothes and doing all this stuff. And that's something that she was super interested in and she was passionate about and she let her chase that. And she didn't think she was going to be a professional basketball player. And she, she did all of that and she's still playing professional basketball anyway. <laughs> yeah. wow. But she still was able to explore her other passions. She was a really great player. I loved having her as a teammate. And now she's like doing her thing overseas. Kind of like what Lexi said, like I wish I had explored more. Like my mom wanted me to be in theater, take like drama, stuff like that. Yeah. And I didn't. I think my vision was like, no, I like, I like basketball, work out, like have fun playing with my friends, like stuff like that. And that was what I wanted to do and like what I felt like I was good at. You know, because a lot of kids, when you're, not, um, when you're not exposed to enough stuff, then you can't find out what you're good at. Because like, it could have been that all of us put a lot of time in basketball and we didn't find out that like musically we're really gifted or like actually like in school, like maybe you wanted to be a scientist. Like, you, you know, it could have just been a lot of things that you never tapped into because I put so much and in I basketball. And I think more coaches need to be held accountable for things like that. Yeah. yeah. Like, because you don't know that, like you don't know. You don't know stuff. what you're gonna do young after. People and their parents don't know to talk to the current players or players who have been there before, but they should really do their research to make sure that you're finding because it's an it's a staff's job to put a a, a front up a little bit. Like you're trying to present yeah. the best things you about sell, an opportunity. You're selling something. Yeah, you're yeah. selling it, and so you're not gonna tell like the hey. <laughs> We're not going to let you go in the summer, actually. You need to be here. We're not going to, like, let you take any other classes. Besides, we're not going to let you have a harder major. You're going to have, like, a general studies. You won't be able to do shit with it when you leave, but, like, <laughs> I need you in practice. Yeah. I need you in practice because yeah. I need to keep my job. I need wins. So, you know, that like, to go back to what you asked, advice for young kids, before you get to college, do your research on coaching. <laughs> What I'm hearing from you guys is uh, there's a lot of sacrifice that comes into basketball. So I want to know the biggest sacrifice that you all had. What did you have to give up for basketball? My time. Mm. My time, memories, family time, missing out on birthdays, celebrations, weddings. And again, I have a big family. I've missed, I haven't seen some of my siblings play a basketball game because I was always gone. Mm -hmm. And, you know, overseas didn't help that as well. Um, the past year and a half, I've finally been able to like reclaim my life in a way mm -hmm. and spend time doing things that make me happy mm -hmm. and finding Isabel. And for the longest, I've just been 
consumed with basketball because it's my job, right? It's what we do to pay bills. But at the end of the day, I still want to be separate of basketball and just find myself. So the time is, that's the hardest thing for me. How do you not resent that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think a part of you just feels like, man, you, like you're, you're in this competitive atmosphere where you're trying to get better every day. You're trying to be the best. You're trying to win. So you're telling yourself that this sacrifice is worth it. Like, it'll be worth it in the end. I'll get to this point. I'll win a championship, feel fulfilled all these things, but you don't get that stuff back. But you know, I don't think it's, it's not a ton different. Like people miss stuff in their regular jobs too. Like ours is a little different when you're overseas. It's hard to get mm -hmm. back here and then go back. Um, but yeah, I think that's the biggest thing. I think you just have to, you know, do what's best for you at the end of the day. And, and you are in charge of the sacrifices that you're willing to make in which area, if you want to make less money, if you want to make more money, if you want to spend time with your family, less time. Even to this day, my mother thanks me and tells me how grateful she is to be able to have seen the world because if I wasn't playing basketball, she probably would have never, you know, left North Carolina or left the state. Um, so knowing that the sacrifices that I made, also my family was able to enjoy as well, um, made it worth it in that aspect. I knew I always wanted to be a pro basketball player because I wanted to be just like my dad. Like, that's something that I always wanted to do. I wanted to play in the NBA. Like, that was my initial why. dream. Like, I want to be an NBA player like, like my dad. Come on, love and I basketball. think that <laughs> <laughs> when he coached in the WNBA was when I was like, oh no, this, I want to be a WNBA player. And I think that was the moment that like changed my life completely. And I was like, I, I want to be just like them when I grow up. My tag was like D Brown's daughter. Like that's always what it was. And I love that and we love that. And we've, you know, prospered together with that. And now it's like <laughs> kind of flipped a little bit. And I think that happened, I think that happened when I got to Duke. And I think that's when I kind of started forming my own identity a little bit separate from him but still having him a part of me all the time. Um, and now just seeing him, how like, proud he is of me, of the things I'm doing on and off the court. You know, you saw us in Chicago. I was in the middle. I thought I won the championship too. I was like, <laughs> oh, you did. I was right there like, yes, like you did. Wait, just what? seeing my dad like that, it's just like, like this is why, like, yeah. this is why I did all of this. And like, obviously my mom was super proud too, but, but like just seeing him that like, happy. Everybody won. <laughs> But, you know, moments like that, like when we, we go back to sacrifice, you have moments like that. You're like, yes, this is why. This is why I did what I did. This is why I'm here. And this is why I love doing what I do. Yeah, it's Ty on the beat. I'm back. My mic keep messing up on me. They want me to talk again, so honestly, I'm Keep going, you feel me now? Keep going. <laughs> so we like it. Uh, yes, I'm here. Hope you're ready to do that. Take this music. Confuse it. Right, one movie. One movie. The end of one movie. Um, Basketball. Oh, Coach Carter. And I want you to leave the people with one fun fact about you that we don't know. Hey, this question. You have one or no? I, I have don't. One. Go ahead. Um, I'm so intrigued by, like, having dirt on the floor and like sweeping, it brings me like a sense of relief to see like dirt come together and have it, dis I'm being dead ass, like, and have it disappear. Like you pick it up, now everything's pristine or having like carpet not be clean and to like just vacuum and see it disappear. And as you see dirt ahead, now you're seeing like Numb behind. It's satisfying. I'm just too. like, yeah, like I really, really I enjoy that. Things. But I don't like just watching. I like doing, doing it. Oh, it was a carpet. You could have cleaned it earlier. If it was a carpet, I would have loved I to clean it. Oh, or like, I like to get my hand wet on carpet and rub it in a circle if there's hair on it, and then you quickly are able to pick up it. That, that is gross. That's disgusting. If it's my hair, I'm like, <laughs> how do you know it's your <laughs> hair? If it's my room or like my apartment. But how did you room. find out you love this? <laughs> I want to know that story. story. When I was trying to pick up hair on a carpet on carpet before, yeah. it's like there will be more than you think sometimes. So then I realized, okay, it's getting kind of hard to pick it up after a while. Like my hand feels exactly. weird, so I was like, let me wet my hand, and then um, I just get two fingers okay. like this. Yeah. Does anybody have? Has anybody experienced this? Jesus Christ! But I'm gonna try it. 
Okay. No. Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. I made that all that up. Go ahead, Izzy. Like, I've been looking at this carpet since we've been here, and I'm like, <laughs> once I get my hands on this. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming through of today course. to my long table because, you know, we don't want to be here with anybody else but y'all until I talk to the rest of you. Yeah, <laughs> right? You have another segment.